everybody, Chad Rosenberg from Rosenberg and Parker, and I am here today again with Dave Cooper. Uh, I want to start off by thanking everybody who participated and listened in to Dave's presentation last week. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. We had a great turnout. It was a great presentation, and we had a lot of terrific questions, so many that we didn't get to answer them all. So what we thought we would do would, uh, was to get together again, and uh, we're doing this not live. This is just me and Dave talking amongst ourselves, and I'm going to ask Dave a bunch of questions that were asked by our audience, and then he's going to answer them, and then we're going to uh, make this available to our, our fans, so uh, to all the people who listen. So before we start, um, obviously I want to thank Dave for, for his participation uh, last week and again this week. Really kind of you to take the time out, Dave, to, to speak to us. Um, I also do want to mention your charity. Uh, we, we last week uh, told people that we we're going to make a donation to the Word of Honor Fund, which Dave is a member of the board of and is a terrific organization that helps the kids of Navy SEALs who were killed in the line of duty. And so it's a wonderful organization. And I want to thank everybody who listened to our presentation who did contribute because we had quite a few people who went online and clicked over and made a contribution. And please feel free to do that uh, again. Or And if you do, we will match all donations made through our website. So with that, uh, welcome, Dave. Thanks for coming on today and talking to us again. My pleasure. Happy to be so, here. Uh, and uh, it's a little gloomy today uh, outside, but uh, happy to be inside and, and cozy, right? Um, so uh, why don't we, uh, I'm going to just read these questions to you and uh, why don't we just uh, get it going. So the first question is around a, a topic that's kind of funny in some ways, but also really I think speaks to people's anxiety levels, which is toilet paper. Uh, obviously we have heard and seen the shortages of toilet paper out there in the stores and online. It is really hard to find it. And one of our listeners from last week said, why toilet paper? Why are people so anxious to the point where they're hoarding toilet paper? What does this mean in terms of stress, anxiety, and people's psyches? Uh, babe, that, that, it's a great question. I was going to, I want to share this because I thought I could tie every question back into this model. Um, and that model is, you know, just a synopsis of what I talked about last week. I don't know if I can tie that question into this model though, but I can, I can certainly perhaps answer. But let me just show this quickly. Um, so this is uh, the summary of all the things we had talked about last week, putting it all to week. There's our putting it all to work, you know, with the anxiety, there were a couple tactics that we use, try the breathing, right? The box breathing is one that I gave you. There are others out there as well. We can reframe it. In other words, if our bodies are primed to perform, it's not necessarily anxiety dispute it. There's a couple ways we can go there. The stress offers us uh, uh, some tactics as well. We can accept those daily hassles. We can't, we don't want to beat ourselves up and stuff like that. And routines are great. Putting our uh, problems into two buckets, one that we can control or manage and the other that we, we can't. But I also mentioned that sometimes those, those bucket two questions where we have no control, if we leverage the people around us and the network, sometimes people have solutions. Uh, and I gave an example from my own uh, life as a SEAL. And then lastly, the coping strategies. And those are, those are uh, bigger, broader efforts about connecting, about using those joyful distractions and planning them into the day. And care for self and care for others. And that aspect of caring for others is not just altruistic, but it actually makes us, us feel better. So that's a, just a real quick recap. And I'll stop sharing this and I will go and try and answer that question that you asked, asked me. And I would say, um, uh, you know, it's, we used to say a person's worth his or her weight in gold. We might uh, someday be saying a person's worth his or her weight in toilet paper. It's become so valuable. Um, this is a kind of panic behavior, and I think, uh, in a sense, it is. There's more than one way to describe this, but it, uh, to me, it's a kind of panic behavior. Uh, I think it's not unlike if you if you uh, you know you go to a mall or something like that. The mall is full of people, and you see somebody sprint by you. You know that might you might find it curious, and let's say they're sprinting towards the exit, uh, but you might not do anything, and then maybe another person sprints by towards the exit, and maybe another person and another person, and at some point you are going to follow suit. You're gonna turn and say, hey, something's going on here. Here's anxiety uh, and we're going to head for the exit. Everybody's different. 
So for some people, they see one person sprint by and they will sprint with them towards the exit. For other people, it might take 100 people sprinting by them. Um, toilet paper is kind of the same. At some point, somebody you know, uh, bought the biggest roll of a package of toilet paper they could and that behavior started to spread. So one person's panic essentially infected everyone or nearly everyone else. Uh, and that started this kind of panic buying on toilet paper. And one by one, people started to follow it. And the end result is uh, our grocery store shelves are devoid of, of toilet paper. And if you buy toilet paper, uh, you sometimes feel a little bit sheepish. I know I've done this and people looking at you as if you're a hoarder yourself. But that's one of the ways to describe it. Yeah, that doesn't yeah, Richard, I think you're describing was that. kind of the flight or fight or flight thing, right? I mean, when, when you start to sprint towards the exit because somebody else does or you follow other people that's the flight taking over right yeah it's a it's a form of uh you you are mirroring another person's uh panic if you will and it's mm -hmm. this, this kind of group panic behavior but yeah it's very similar to that yeah yeah something uh, it's anxiety something is amiss other people are handling it this way so social proof uh, they're handling it by buying toilet paper or they're handling it by running to the exit. Therefore, I'm going to do the, the exact same thing. That's just one way to another person. Another, uh, you know, others would say, well, it's a form of control that we can exercise. We have a need for some form of autonomy. And this is an easy one to exercise to buy, uh, you know, toilet paper and paper towels and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So our next question is uh, has to do with getting sleep. Obviously, getting sleep is a very important thing all the time, but especially right now, because, you know, sleep helps your body repair and helps you stay healthy, right? But yeah. how uh, can you can you talk about maybe some tools that people can use when their stress levels, anxiety levels are so high that they are having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? Yeah. Um, I think one of the ways, one of the things to recognize is that we, we consider mastery a resource. So if you're really good at something, you're really good at your job. As a Navy SEAL, we, we mastered you know, many of the environments or all of the environments that we worked in. With that mastery comes this ability to manage stress, right? I don't feel uncomfortable when I'm standing on one side of a doorway uh, with my teammates and the bin Ladens of the world are on the other side of the doorway. Now that's, that condition is kind of normal for me, but if, you know, if you put me in an operating room and gave me a scalpel and said, Hey, uh, you know, you have to take out your son's kidney. I, I would not have that same level of mastery and there, that would be, create a great deal of stress, obviously. Um, so the problem is in a situation like we're experiencing right now, mastery is in short supply. If it's, you know, I don't know anybody that is masterful in this kind of situation. So perhaps only those hanging on to the notion that this is all a hoax sleep soundly at night. For the rest of us, though, uh, we have to practice some level of acceptance, right? There are some of the things we can't control. So that goes into that group two pot. We're back into that model now. Uh, and then there's some of the things that we do have power to control. We have autonomy over. Um, uh, and sleep is one of those things, right? So there are, you know, we we said when we, if we go back into that model, and if you recall what I said during uh, the presentation, uh, in that group one, those situations that you do have some autonomy, some choice, some control in, uh, now's the time to, to generate and test options. Well, some of those options you might try out are, are some of the apps that are out there. There's Calm, there's Headspace, if you belong to, you know, groups like Peloton and stuff like that. They have breathing exercises and meditation, if you want to call it that, um, that can help you out. So there's one of the things to try out. Um, obviously, there are medications that we can try out. Uh, I said, you know, previously when stress gets, uh, stress levels get so high that real therapy and medication is important. It's kind of like a ventilator. Uh, it helps us to breathe until we can breathe on our own. So medications prescribed by a doctor uh, are that way. I have taken Ambien before when I absolutely had to sleep. You could uh, avoid protein. Careful with Ambien, though, right? Lot, lot, okay, lot of side effects with Ambien. Prescribed by a doctor, right? It right, has to be. Right. Ambien is one of those controlled substances. Um, uh, avoid proteins late at night. That's another way, uh, you know, we would uh, uh, avoid getting amped up. Protein is a central nervous stimulant. Uh, in other words, it, it pumps you up a little bit. If, if you're hungry at night, here's your excuse to eat that uh, bowl of cereal, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. The carbohydrates can put you to sleep. Um, 
So, and then, and then go back into the model, exercise, right? Exercise can help us reduce stress and fall asleep, connecting with friends out there, whether it's virtually or you know, practicing the social distancing, again, helps us to, to reduce stress levels. And then all those coping mechanisms, connect I just mentioned, but uh, you know, planning in those happy distractions, caring for self, caring for others, all these things can lower stress and help us get to sleep. And then lastly, you accept the fact that you can't get to sleep. Uh, and that means you get up. You know, you, you know, uh, everybody has a different uh, form of advice for this, but if you're lying there for about 30 minutes and you can't sleep, uh, then it's time perhaps to get up and, and uh, now's a great, uh, great time to exercise that joyful distraction and in the middle of the night, engage in that uh, uh, Netflix binge, if you will. Mm -hmm. right? So those yeah, are some ways. Yeah. Two things that, that also come to mind. One you talked about before, which is the uh, square breathing or the uh, rectangular box breathing, breathing, right? Box breathing, where you but you get from calm and headspace and those apps. Right, and when you, you do that, that things. can help, you know, yeah. put your mind at ease and and just yeah. create a distraction. And uh, mm -hmm. and then the other thing, the other advice I would give uh, is to avoid the news right before bed. Uh, you know, one of the things I found early on was that I was watching various news channels or reading articles on my phone uh, in bed or, or, or late at night before going to bed. And that, uh, that especially if you read a particularly negative article, depressing article, yeah. it can really, you know, keep you up, literally keep you up at night. Uh, and so, uh, you know, my, one of the things I try to do now is not watch news after whatever hour, six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Uh, a couple hours before I go to bed so that it's not right on right in my mind as fresh as as you know having just watched it or listened to it so that's not so, piece of advice I would that's say. terrific advice yeah you're back in the model again that's a positive kind of routine if you will routines are good sleep routines are good try not to deviate from them uh, what you're mentioning there is what we call an availability bias so uh, you know the, the, the things that come to mind are the things we most recently experienced that kind of thing um, so um, this is one of those things. If you are reading a story that makes you anxious right before you go to bed, that's going to stay right there. Uh, if you're going to read anything, then then perhaps, you know, this is when we back into the model again, and we're talking about social uh, media and stuff like that. Curate your sites. Go visit those things that that, that make you happy, if you will. I'm looking at pictures of, of, of uh, friends, kids, reliving uh, fond memories, things like that. But yeah, stay away from the things that exacerbate the anxiety. The anxiety, yeah. So the next question has, it's not really necessarily COVID related. It's, uh, it's just more, uh, you know, a psychological kind of question uh, that has to do, I think, with your experience as a SEAL is how do you take uh, nerves and anxiety that somebody might have? And the question was specifically asked with regard to somebody's child who was on a sports team, how to take that anxiety that a per person might have before a game or let's say before a performance, it could be a, you know, a, a recital or, or something like that and channel that into a positive direction to, you know, to, to make them perform better during that, uh, that event. And of course, again, that, that would be pertinent to what you might have done as a, as a SEAL before you had to go on a mission and perform uh, and might have been, been experiencing some anxiety. Yeah, that's uh, the second thing we had talked about. Really, this is reframing. Remember, we said when it comes to anxiety, there's a couple of things you can do very quickly. One is breathe. So those breathe, various breathing techniques that really can help take our mind off of the anxiety, but also change our blood chemistry, even if just a little, and it helps us to settle down. Uh, those got those stretch receptors in the lungs. Uh, the other one, though, in this case in particular, is the reframing. Is it really anxiety that we're experiencing, or is it in this case it's our body saying, "Hey, I'm, I am, I'm ready to perform." Right now, we yeah. do have to temper the effects of this. I gave the the example in the presentation of my eight year old son who always says this to me before his swim meets, "Daddy, I'm nervous." And I say, "What does that mean?" He said, "Well, that means my body's ready to go." It is, and now we can use okay. some of those breathing techniques to uh, to take our uh, to temper the effects. We perform best not when we're asleep and not when we're so amped up that we are or so fearful that we're paralyzed by the fear and anxiety. So it's a, a space in the middle there. So we've got we've to temper that a little bit and we can do that through those breathing exercises. We can do that through joyful distractions. You know, if you talk to kids, you know, joyful distraction is their phone or it's their iPad or something like that. But all of these things tend to work and, and you can even practice a little gratitude by acknowledging that your body is saying, hey, I'm ready to go here uh, and it's time to get out of my way. And yes, you know, before, 
you know, every mission, uh, not every mission, some became routine, but for a number of missions, that was certainly, uh, you, you know, something that we experienced. You get a little bit nervous. Uh, now you got to ask yourself, hey, why am I getting nervous? Is there something about this mission that's frightening me or is it my body saying, hey, I'm ready to go? Uh, and then you share those experiences with, you know, we did with our teammates and we would talk through those things. And that's another way of, of, of uh, tempering the effects uh, of anxiety and stress, if you will. But yeah, yeah, go right back into the model, reframe it. Well, and then another thing is just being prepared, right? When, if you know that you're prepared, uh, you know, whether it's going on stage to speak to an audience, whether it's going onto a, a field to compete in an athletic event or, or whatever else might, a boardroom to have a meeting, if you're prepared, then that anxiety level can come down. And, and when you have a, a kid, I think, who is nervous, you can say, well, look, that's what you've been practicing. This is what you've been practicing for, right? Yeah. To get and in that pool, way to get on that field. And uh, yeah, and that, and that can be, you know. And that sense important. of preparation, that sense of preparation is not unlike mastery. You're ready to exactly go. Exactly right. You are masterful in an environment that will automatically help you ameliorate or lessen the effects of stress. Yep, the problem absolutely. comes in those times when we don't, you know, we don't have that mastery, if you will. So now the next one is, is related to this, which is for after this is all, over or, or well let's not even say after it's all over let's say as it's you know right now states um are, are talking about getting back to work organizations are talking about trying to reopen and you know we're trying to see if we can get this economy reopened and people are anxious about it right if, if people are those who are going to be asked to return to work are anxious about returning to work you know about being around other people um and potentially getting sick right so and they have a certain amount of what we're going to, what I'm going to call post-traumatic stress disorder. They're stressed about this trauma that we've experienced about the disease and being home and, and being told that being outside is dangerous. And so how do we help our employees to feel less stress? How does an organization use that, um, ch channel that anxiety and concern into a, a positive direction for an organization? So yeah, kind of a post-traumatic growth, I guess, is, is kind of what you're hinting at here. Um, again, I I, we're going to go back to that model because there are some of the solutions are in there. You just have to be a little bit creative with them. But those, those uh, uh, tactics, if you will, and strategies are all uh, things that if you practice them will encourage growth. And remember I said that they are even more profound if you practice them together. And I, I think if you, if you think about it, uh, you know, this way that... Um, you know, our muscles grow when they're stressed, right? Not too much stress, not too little stress, just the right amount of stress. Uh, it's kind of the way we train and exercise then that affords us that growth. So, you know, some people are born, we know these people, they're born strong and they're more inclined to be resilient when it comes to exercise. And so they might not have to do as much. Some of us, others have to work hard, really hard. Uh, interestingly, we find that, the, you know, for those people who are born gifted, sometimes they rest on their laurels when others were working hard to develop these practices yeah. can become more resilient. And uh, so my point here is we can leave growth up to chance uh, or we can work at it. And these practices, uh, you know, breathing, reframing, disputing some of the anxiety, right, as we, we uh, talked about previously, um, accepting those small daily hassles, not demeaning ourselves, not making light of them because they can add up. We have to accept them and, um, and conserve our energy, if you will, for those big ones. Find a new and healthy routines. That's another aspect of this. Concentrating on the things that we can control and practicing acceptance where we can't or leveraging that network again, because there's always people that might be able to help us solve that. Um, and then we, those, those strategies, again, of connecting, of distracting, of caring for ourselves and caring for others. And then we repeat, uh, rinse and repeat and keep practicing those things that we will set the stage inside of a family, inside of an organization and inside of ourselves uh, for growth. What we wanna do though, as business owners and leaders though, as a, the initial thing anyway, is create that space where you can have some really honest dialogues. And this is where you go into that, again, back into that model, that full on empathy, listen, don't necessarily try and solve and make people feel better and say, hey, I understand, uh, you know, we've been robbed, this is unfortunate, it's terrible. Uh, and now we start guiding our team towards some of those 
tactics and strategies where we start to together uh, manage the, the stress and lessen the effects of it and come up with what we call integrative thinking. We start coming up with some really neat solutions or creative solutions. It gets back into the group one thing where we generate and test solutions. We got to get creative. So now we're using people, not using them, that must be the wrong, wrong word, but we're, we're involving them in uh, these change processes. They've been at home, now they're coming back to work. Again, the change is something that creates stress in us. Whatever it might be, some will handle it better than others. Uh, we create that space where we can have that honest conversation. We steer people towards those coping strategies and those uh, tactics that I mentioned. And then we start getting creative about how we're going to solve some of the issues that confront us. And no one can say what these are. This is the really neat thing about how uh, solutions to some of our more complex problems emerge, right? And emerge is a great word there. They kind of come into existence, if you will. They're not predictable, but there's some really neat ones I think that can come up, but you won't. Uh, or come about, but we won't know that until we bring that group together and we create that space for an honest dialogue. That would be my I suggestion. think there has to be a recognition that it's going to, especially for some people within our organization, but uh, it's going to take some time, right? This is very much a new thing. You know, it's a novel mm -hmm. virus. It's a novel situation that no nobody's ever been through before, at least not for a long, long time, not, not our lifetimes. And, and I think uh, there's the recognition that Eventually, at some point, we don't know when that is yet, people will get back to their normal routine. Um, but it could take time, and, and for some people, it's going to take more time than for other people, right? Um, and, and for some uh, businesses, you make a really great business. point there. Yeah. We, we talk about this in terms of guardrails. These are competing demands. We have uh, the demand of, of life, well-being right. on one hand, the demand of livelihood on the other. We got to get back to work. We got to take care of ourselves and our families. We want to stay healthy, uh, but we also have to get back to work. Those demands are competing against one another right now. We, we say that these are guardrails, right? And the solution is somewhere in there. Right. We don't know exactly where this is where we, this group can come together, can, where we have that honest dialogue to start solving that. But again, go back into that model. When I talked about we have to give ourselves permission to not be perfect. So between those guardrails is a solution. And quite often we'll meander bouncing off the guardrails as we try and figure this out. Um, and again, giving ourselves permission to, to not be uh, uh, perfect, to recognize that decisions are dynamic in this kind of environment, that they're provisional. So I might make a decision today uh, because the future is provisional. I don't know what's going to happen. We have to understand that those decisions might change. Obviously, people working in the healthcare industry are seeing this where, you know, as my wife said one day, they're told by uh, you know the CDC that, okay, it's okay to wear a surgical mask the next day, it's oh, you gotta wear the N95, then to come back and say surgical masks are okay. So all of these things are changing, drives people crazy. And you have to, as you said, you, you wanna acknowledge that and be transparent about it right up front. And yeah. that the decisions will be dynamic, uh, but that, that the solutions exist between those guardrails, but you gotta do some bouncing off of those guardrails as we move forward through this. So, yeah, and it's gonna be different for different people too, right? I mean, obviously- Very different context matters. Matters. Yeah. Context matters. It's going to have a lot to do with people's own uh, sense of danger, right? Like you can yeah. have a 30, uh, 30 year old healthy person who says, I'm ready to get back to work because they're low risk and yeah. they've never experienced any health issues. And you could have somebody who's a little bit older with an underlying condition that, you know, that is very concerned that if they, they get it, it could really, really be serious. And uh, even though it could be serious for anybody, obviously, it's a higher likelihood yeah. if you have certain certain things that contribute. So we're going to, I think organizations are going to have to be sensitive to that as well, but it's different for yeah. different people. And I have kids at home. That's the other thing a lot of people are going to run into. Yeah. School's out, kids are at home. Uh, for some people, it's, it means, uh, you know, child care might cost more than what they're actually making. So these are some really difficult challenges we're up against. And the solution isn't going to come from top down. It does come from the inside out. And it comes from people coming together to, to holding that space where you can have that dialogue. And that's where solutions will begin to emerge. They won't be the perfect ones. You know, that much we know. There you go. All right, our next question has to do with your days as a SEAL. Uh, and it's tied into exactly what we have just been talking about, but can you relate one of your most stressful or anxiety-filled moments as a SEAL, perhaps a particular mission uh, that, was, that you were concerned about? I know you've told me in our discussions over the years that you guys pretty much, you know, obviously preparation was key and you always, I don't know if always is the right word, you mostly felt very prepared for 
the missions that you went on. And if you didn't, you didn't do it. But can you think of a particular case where maybe you felt like you weren't quite as prepared and where you were uh, a little bit more concerned about the outcome and, and what did you do to, uh, to you know, to, to be successful? Uh, yeah, this is, this is an easy question. You know, as I got in 2001, I was you know, a team leader. Um, so, you know, everything the team did, I was, you know, at the front of that team or somewhere near the front of that team. As I got more and more senior, I started going more and more to the back. Um, and I can tell you that watching others do the job of just say going through that doorway where, you know, there are dangerous people on the other side of that door with machine guns. Uh, and your teammate is going through that door and accepting all the risks. My heart used to beat out of my chest uh, watching that. And there were missions where uh, it didn't take the whole squadron, and it would only take a team, eight guys. And those, you know, say like, you know, these would sneak into to, to, uh, you know an Al Qaeda guy's compound uh, and and put a listening device in his car or something like that. So this team would go out there and do that, and they're in the middle of the night and they're creeping in the to a, you know, a compound where there's bunches of armed men who are hell bent on our destruction. And we're gonna put a little listening device on the car. And of course, technology is such that we could watch this happening with the drones up high. Uh, and yeah, as I sat there and watched those things from the safety of the base, uh, my heart used to beat out of my chest as they sneak into, you know, up on these cars in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, during the, the spring and summer months in particular, people sleep outside, often right beside their cars or right above their cars and carports and stuff like that. So, you know, some of my teammates were literally feet away from these really dangerous uh, militants who are heavily armed uh, doing things like this. And as I said, my, you know, I, I'm watching that. My heart's beating out of my chest, I think, during the, the bin Laden mission when that helicopter went into that slow controlled crash and we were able to watch it uh, you know i took one big deep breath and said here we go you know and and of course we were prepared uh, that was our weakest link and we were prepared for it and the guy it didn't slow the guys down at all but there was that moment there where i'm like you know here we go again but those are the times that 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 frightened me the most watching others do the job not actually doing so in other words you would you felt less stress and anxiety being at the front of that line than you did at the back of that line or watching yeah. remotely yeah there's no you know it the sounds like you're well suited to be a seal that's what it sounds <laughs> yeah. like to me you, well at the front of it you think about it there's no there was no time for thinking you were you were yeah. dialed into the moment the job right. makes you mindful which is one of the benefits of of, uh, of mastery you know, that whatever it is that you are a master at makes you mindful and you live in that moment and there was no real time to consider uh, you know, all the risks, those, you did that beforehand and you did that afterwards, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, so watching it happen and unfurl this, you know, uh, it, it was, 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 was to me, uh, frightening. Yeah. Yeah. It all sounds frightening, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I can understand, uh, where you're coming from there. So, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and so our last question is, uh, came from one of our uh, participants again was, can you recommend any, we're gonna call them personal development or self-development books that uh, folks might want to, to take a look at? Anything that comes to your mind, what are your favorites? Oh, well, this is a bias, right? Um, sure. I am you know, one of those guys that goes around and preaches, and I just mentioned it, this, this aspect of mindfulness. And I, you know, I don't think we have to be Mother Teresa's or uh, the Dalai Lama, both two, two individuals who uh, you know, practice mindfulness meditation for hours a day. Most of us don't have hours a day. We have kids and we have jobs, right? Uh, and we can't sit still for four hours a day. I can't do that. But the practice is profound. Uh, it, you know, it's been a, a practice of mine uh, the, since the mid 1990s, a serious practice. Uh, it was certainly something that um, we were equipped with in the SEAL teams. We know the value of a practice like that. Um, now, where can you go to find something that's workable? A guy by the name of Dan Harris, who's a, many might know Dan or recognize the name. He's a journalist, a television journalist, uh, also got interested in it and wrote a book called 10% Happier. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the theme of that is, is that this practice, this learning to, as this all gets back to what we we're talking about, about stress, that, you know, that number one thing that we can do when we're anxious, go into some of these breathing techniques, 
mindfulness goes much farther than that. Uh, you know, we start to recognize that we start to place judgment on ourselves. We start to place judgment on others. Uh, we're judging situations. We're judging people in situations. Um, mindfulness allows us to take a step back from that. Uh, there are profound impacts on the brain. So that's a great book. I would recommend it to anybody. 10% happier. 10% yep. happier. Um, you know, the subtle art of not giving a hoot. Uh, it's not, <laughs> it's, uh, it's another book that is uh, a guy by the name of Mark, um, Mark Manson wrote that book. And uh, I would say lastly, um, it's something I'm doing with the kids and a friend of mine wrote this book. It just came out. The book is called Karma by Joanne Flynn. Um, it's not about karma per se. It's, uh, it's about practicing kindness. Uh, and she has 31 lessons in the book. Mm. And, you know, it's, almost as soon as it came out and I landed on it, found the book and tried it out. You know, I, I said to the kids when, you know, six weeks ago when, when they were told, Hey, no more school, I said, okay, we got to get back to a routine. So I, I mentioned it's nine to two, we're doing schoolwork. And then we try and do some kind of exercise after that. But our goals were to get stronger, smarter, faster. That was the first goal. And then this book came out and I looked at it and I opened it up and these simple little exercises for practicing kindness, which if you have, children, you know that they need to practice kindness. Yeah. Go back into the model again, right? Practicing kindness actually makes us feel better. So I thought, aha, and now our goal is to get stronger, faster, smarter, and kinder. Mm -hmm. um, and so we practice these things is the great little uh, 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 exercises that you can practice every single day. And as I said, but, uh, you know, Throughout the course of the day, when my kids are doing the exact opposite of uh, these lessons, I'm able to remind them and say, hey, you know, they were trying to be kind to each other. And this is one of the lessons that we're talking about. And the kids are like, oh, yeah, right. So is it taking hold? Yeah, it takes time, but uh, it's a good book. Yeah. So I would say those, those are three great places to start and see where you go from there. If that whets your appetite. But uh, I like those books. That's, yeah. Thank you. That's terrific. You know, one thing I'll add, it's not a book. It's a class. I don't know if you've heard about this, but... It has become the most popular class at Yale, and it's um, it's the science of happiness. Yeah, it was started several years ago by a professor at Yale who noticed that these students at Yale who were so excited to get to Yale, right, and be at one of the elite institutions in the country in the world, got to Yale and then were quickly becoming miserable. Um, depressed, anxious, uh, suicidal in some cases, right? Because mm. of the stress. They're, they're used to being number one in their class and suddenly they're just another smart person at Yale. And so she's decided to look into the science of happiness and it became the most popular class at uh, Yale. You can take it online. So you can actually yes. audit the course, I believe, for free. Yeah. But, and I can't remember the name of the professor, but if you Google it, obviously you can find out. Uh, but she also has a, a a podcast called the happiness lab and i've listened to a number of the uh, the episodes of this happiness lab and it's really good stuff so i would recommend that as well you know and this gets back again i'm, I'm taking people back into that model but those practices particularly when we talk about resiliency and stuff like that again we can leave this stuff to chance but we can also adopt some of these practices that are pretty simple and, and stack the odds in our favor. Sure. Uh, and that's really, you know, my intention when I talk to people about stress and anxiety, um, some people will come through with fine, no issues whatsoever. Other people will struggle, but again, uh, that's leaving it to chance. Uh, even those who come through it fine can come through it finer if they adopt a few simple practices. And I know about that class at Yale too. And that's simply the same. They're, they're, the message is the same. We can stack the deck in our favor, not perfectly, um, but give us a you know a fighting chance, if you will, a fifty-one percent chance of succeeding, as opposed to as again, it's a roll of the dice. We don't don't necessarily want to do that. Yeah, but yeah, Great. good point. I like it. So before we go, uh, and that's yeah. the last of our questions. But uh, so before we go, though, I <clears> wanted to ask you about your book. I know you're writing a book. I know it's not a, yeah. a book. I don't think it's a book about your days as a <laughs> It's not a Navy SEAL book either. It's not a tell-all yeah. uh, military book. But why don't you just tell everybody about what you're doing and, uh, you know, and then when you expect to, uh, it, it to be available. Um, yeah, that, definitely not. By the way, I'm giving you a deadline now by, uh, by asking <laughs> you this, right? I'm hoping to help you uh, get it done. That book is really, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the plaque behind me, right? It's the 38 call sign patches of my teammates who died. Um, and, uh, the impetus was you know, 
you know, when I was in grad school, I had a professor say, have you ever wonder why your teams are so successful, but the United States military is not. Um, and I'd been wondering that for a long time. And, and so I'm sorry, let it interrupt. So when you say your teams, the, the Navy SEAL teams are very successful, but the military, the U.S. military as a whole, not as much. Not. And that's a tough thing to, to face up to. And those small teams are very successful. Um, but if you look at Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, we've not won those wars. Those wars that require us to adapt, are, we don't do well at. Um, you know, Vietnam, 56,000 soldiers died over, you know, close to any somewhere between 1 million and 2 million Vietnamese civilians. Um, and, and, and for me, it's personal. You know, um, sure. we will leave Afghanistan. Uh, it will look much like it did when we got there. So what do we do? The politicians will redefine victory, but, you know, we didn't, we didn't win. We have failed to achieve our objectives. Uh, same place in Iraq. Really, Somalia is not in the news as much, nor is Yemen, but same thing there. Um, so I took that, my experiences, and, and the book does have a lot of anecdotes in. Uh, from my time in the SEAL teams. Um, hmm. But it is a look at the United States military through the lens of complexity science. And what does that, you know, complexity science, a lot of physics, a lot of biology, but, you know, what does it tell us about how big systems operate, how they change, adapt, learn, and grow, and stuff like that? And there's some fascinating lessons we can take away from that. And if you use that and you look at that through that lens, it comes, you know, the, the, the conclusion is pretty simple, and that is the United States military and the way that it's organized. Uh, it's an ancient or antiquated class system. Uh, it does not adapt well. Uh, we're fine if we pit two massive armies, us against somebody else, and we can bring in technology and then our d industrial capability and all that stuff. Uh, but we don't do nearly as well in those places where our enemies are quick to adapt and we are not. Uh, and so that's really what the book is about. And of course, you can take all of those lessons uh, in that book and apply them to a business of any size. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's the intention. And it starts with a story about a, you know, uh, one of my teammates who, who said, hey, you know, do you realize that this is a class system? And what he meant by is the United States military is a class system. And he called it a caste system. And I said, yes, I do realize that. I've always known that. But we are, we are getting the better end of the deal. We operators. We're the ones who are out there, you know, uh, experiencing what it's like to, to all of these hardships and to, to learn and adapt and grow. And there's that you know, a great deal of self-knowledge that comes from that. But in the end, you know, is it worth the price that we have had to pay? And uh, I don't think it is. We need to make some changes. So um, that's what the book's about. And it's do you have definitely a word title? Does the, the book have a title called, yet? Yeah, it's called Hidebound, Resistant to Change is what the word means. Yeah. So okay. and we and have the United States it? military. Do we have a date? Well, no, we don't have a date yet. So uh, I have to finish. I, I was supposed to be finished uh, uh, in September. Uh, so uh, the date has been moved back. Uh, I will be finished by this summer and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully maybe available next year, early next, next year? year would, or, well, no, it would probably take 12 months from that. So if we're okay. talking a, a, a year to 18 months out. At the same time, we're getting a vaccine for COVID. We will be getting hope, a book. We sure hope so. Paper. All right. Well, good. So uh, just about the time we're uh, we're all vaccinated, we'll be able to enjoy yeah. your book. Hi, Bounce. There you go. We'll keep uh, once that's available, we'll we'll put a link on our website and uh, let everybody know about it. And send Good. It to, uh, yeah. We will all look forward to reading it. Well, I appreciate again you're taking the time out to uh, to speak with me and to answer these questions and to address issues that we're all dealing with right now, right? Stress and anxiety yeah. and this crazy time and unknowns that we're dealing with. So. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you real soon. Always happy to help. All right. Thanks, Dave. Yep. Bye-bye.